Welcome to Focus Washington. I'm Chuck Conconey. My guest today is Patrick Gavin. Patrick Gavin is one of the hot reporters at Politico, one of the hottest publications in town. Wow. Patrick, thanks. thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. I want to ask you a couple of questions of all things about Twittering. Mm -hmm. You wrote a piece just recently that the President of the United States, of course, does not Twitter, but there is a White House thing, and I think they said there's some of those 2.6 million people right. are reading it. They are. Uh, the White House has not actually not tweeted a lot uh -huh. since Obama's come into office. During the campaign, he did, but the account has largely fallen quiet since then, which has struck people as a pretty foolish thing. I mean, if you have 2.6 million people following you, why not use it? Uh, I imagine that when he goes up for re-election, he'll do it again. Um, but yeah, for the White House, it would be a great opportunity. I mean, the best thing about Twitter for celebrities and politicians mm -hmm. is that you get to skip the media. You get to skip the filter and go right to the people, and they're people who are interested in what you have to say. So it would be a great way for the Obama administration to just say, here's our views, here are links to policy papers, and, and then the media is sort of out of the loop. Well, we've seen it become a growing thing in Washington. I know McCain has it, and recently the Mexican ambassador to the United States right. here has been, I think, the first, if I'm not mistaken, yes. of all the foreign government you know, people representing here to use it. What good is it to him? Well, you know, it's interesting. The diplomatic community has not embraced it a lot. Um, that's why he's the first, because they tend to be very diplomatic, and they don't want to necessarily give away too much information. Um, but again, I think that for the ambassador, I think for any other ambassador, it is a way um, to reach an audience that you might not otherwise reach. Um, you know, I think especially for the diplomatic community, there's not always stuff that's going on in embassies that warrants front page story. Sure. But there's good work that they're doing. It's just not necessarily sexy news, right? Um, so through Twitter, they can, they can get the message out to people who care uh, that here's what we're doing in our country, here's what we're doing in the United States. And this is stuff that might not, you know, pique the interest of a, of a Washington Post or political reporter, but it's information that they want to get out. So in the diplomatic community, you would say, particularly like with the Mexican ambassador, this has become very useful. And who's his audience? Well, his audience is anybody who wants to follow him. Uh, and that is, uh, my, my guess is that a lot of his audience is going to be fellow members of the diplomatic community here in D.C. It's going to be a lot of folks back home. Um, it's going to be people in the, in the policy community that track the issues that he's tracking. Uh, so for those people, that's actually a very valuable resource. So it looks like, would you predict that this will happen more in the diplomatic community, that you'll find more and more ambassadors at various other embassies doing this? For sure. And I think that, especially because I think uh, embassies have traditionally been, uh, you know, I mean, they're, they're sort of old school. They're old fashioned. Mm -hmm. And Twitter is a great way for them to say, you know, we're going to come into the 21st century too. We're not going to be behind our mansions and our gates. And we're going to reach out to the communities that we serve. So you're a big believer in the social media. I mean, for some people, uh, I mean, a lot of people ask, you know, should I get into it? For a lot of them, I say no. I mean, it's a mm -hmm. huge time consumer if you want to actually do it well. Uh, I use it. I don't necessarily like it. It's just good for me, good for mm -hmm. me personally, good for my job. Um, but it's a lot of time and it's a lot of work and it's just one more thing you have to check. Well, do you, I was going to say, you find yourself checking various things like that. So whether it's the White House or whether it's like the Mexican ambassador, you find yourself checking those. Exactly. I mean, I'm probably uh, a little bit overboard about it, but I mean, I, I would say I spend at least a couple hours a day just surfing it. So, Let me change questions just very quickly. you got a big state dinner coming yes. up. Now, what are the use of state dinners? I mean, you know, what's so important about it? What makes a difference? This is the first one this administration is having. That's correct. It's largely for show. Uh, it's obviously a way to honor the Prime Minister of India who will be in town on Tuesday for the dinner. But there are many ways to honor him. You don't need a state dinner for that. It's a way for the, uh, for the first family to show off the White House. You know, they bring out the best china, the best food, the best silverware. Uh, so it's a way for them to really open up the White House and show a bit of the pomp and circumstance that they have at their fingertips because, you know, during the course of the week, it's usually policy, policy, policy. And so here's a way to add a bit of glamour to maybe take the media off their news cycle about health care or any other touchy issues, and then it's just all, it's all glitter for the White House. Well, it's like Twitter in a way. It's a little different. That's huh? right. That's <laughs> okay. right. Thank you so much for being here, Patrick. Thanks, Chuck. I'm Chuck Conconey, and this has been Focus Washington.